Welcome to church. Welcome to the undying body of the ever-living Son, where God's promises and God's people are radically made one. Welcome to the romance of the world, the marriage ceremony of Christ, where God is betrothed to man by proposing with his life. Welcome to the only place where the unholy can meet holiness and yet holy still survives. Welcome to the only place that you can walk in dead and yet come out alive. Welcome to this place, this place, whether on pews or chairs, in walls or air, under steeples or stairs, by thousands or in pairs, this place, this place is legendary, holy, ancient, modern, famous, hated, living, vibrant, ageless, not because of a location, not because there are cars parked on the pavement, not because you made a sign and named it. This place is an amazement because of the one who creates it. Welcome to the place where individuals are shaped into a larger whole, where bread and wine feed our hearts and intoxicate our souls, where race, money, and power no longer have a role, where the outcast, impoverished, and broken come to be consoled. Welcome to our home, the bride of Christ on a reckless search. Welcome to life. Welcome to church. <laughs> Welcome to Beautyville Church. What I like about being here is how open air it really is. How we are open to the sky, open to the breeze, open to the gentlest of these things that God has provided for us. That whether we be sitting on the grass, or enjoying the cement borders that we can use as seating. Whether we bring a chair or whether we put up umbrellas or we go under the veranda just across the street. God has provided in such a way that we can enjoy the freedom that there is in being free. Because you see, it's often said to many people at different times that the church only wants your money. Well, honey, I got news for you. Vittyville Church doesn't want your money. <laughs> you can keep your money and go where you want with it. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, or Benjamin Franklin the things that are Franklin's, or Lincoln, or whoever it is you got on your money. But you know what? What I got in my heart is what flows out of my mouth. And those things that come from my heart are those things that I really care about. You see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so whatever I'm full of, that is what I talk about. And a lot of times you'll see that if people are stressing or confessing or professing about money, religion, the world, issues, politics, you know, every other thing, relationships, family, whatever it may be, then that's pretty much what they're about. They're all about whatever they talk about. And whatever they talk about is what they're all about. <laughs> Do you see how easy that is? That is Proverbs, and that is the basic foundation of all spiritual discernment that you could possibly have. And it really comes from the book of Proverbs. As a matter of fact, it says that... Uh, in the multitude of words there lacks not sin, but also in the reality of that, that's where man gives away what he's in. In the multitude of words there lacks not sin, and that's the way that man gives away what he's in. In other words, all of mankind really gets involved in sin in some way. Whether it be, you know, if you want to say like the Catholics, menial sins, convenial sins, or whatever kind of sin they happen to be in. That's the sin they're in, or whatever involvement they have in the world. So we learn something by the words we choose. 
we learn something by the words we use. We learn something about the Bible we quote. We learn something about whether or not it's actually the Word of God or just a book that we're using to promote a religion. You see, what we're talking about today is following hard after God. We're talking about pursuing God like the deer that pants after the water. When the sun rose today, we were talking about those things that pertain to God intervening in man's life. Because you see, if God is dead, then this book is worthless. It's just a book. If God's not real and he's not alive, then really we should go into some other psychology and sociology and contend for and pretend for our own mentality to accomplish those purposes we claim we don't know God about. And if I were a natural man, according to the natural order of things, I would come to the conclusion there is a God. Because, you see, the natural man really does come to that conclusion. He can see nature and see God in it. But the scientific man, the religious man, those that think of themselves as wiser, smarter, more intelligent, more scientific, or more technologically advanced, always in their pride, ignores that which is obvious in front of their eyes. Do you understand that? The wise of the world ignore that which is in front of their eyes. But the natural man has to deal with the grass. He has to deal with the open air. He has to deal with the things that he sees, he touches, and he comes into contact every day. And that isn't things that man made, but it's what God has made that he deals with. So he begins to deal with God on an impersonal level that becomes personal when it involves his livelihood when it involves the fact of his life that he needs to depend upon God for something. You discover that very same principle when you go to work. If you're not working, you probably aren't eating. If you get a job, earn some money, pay for your bills, begin to get a house, begin to purchase groceries, you learn that you're dependent upon something or something is providing for you a means with which you can provide for yourself. But if you didn't use any money at all, no money at all, imagine a society, no money at all. Imagine if you grew your own food. You know, we could be greeny for a minute. I mean, summer isn't over yet. We are entering into fall. We do live through the seasons. We have lived as agrarian society, meaning that farm-based communities for centuries that succeeded. And now that we've gotten into technology, we think we're smarter, though we're not quite as free as we think we are, are we? Or we haven't done such a great job with what we've gotten as we thought we did. And now that we're coming to the end of the age, we're realizing, you know what? Maybe this isn't the best that it could be. Maybe cement, you know, is kind of like a combination of things that, while it's a good byproduct, doesn't hold up so well in certain conditions. And yet God has taught us a better way. God has taught us a more excellent way. God has said that I intervene in the way that you go. And so this morning we learned that prevenient grace or the fact that God chose you and God chose to save you and God has decided to talk to you and God has decided to provide for you a way of communication, that is something that God has done. What we want to talk about now is a little bit deeper on that same theme about interacting with God. Because you see, a lot of what we do in technology, a lot of what we do in society, a lot of what we do as modern man is to reject God and not interact with God. The farmer in his day interacted with God. We mentioned this morning how the farmers of Klamath Falls, Oregon, that were outside of the town over on the backside of Hogsback Ridge, in the ranches and some of them in the south towards Malin prayed for rain and they would get rain. They would pray for their harvest. They would get a harvest. They would pray at times when no one else was having or succeeding in farming and they succeeded. 
Now, I'm not going to say that lasted all their generations or, you know, to their children's children. But at the time that I was there, I saw it and I could tell the truth of it. I can bear witness to it because I saw it myself with my own eyes. That was one of those things that was miraculous about the poverty that was experienced in Oregon at the time that I was there. But today we're talking about something a little different. We're pursuing hard after God. We're going forward with what we taught this morning. We're choosing to see how God intervenes in our life and how God wants to interject himself in your life. How God really is working on you and with you, whether you know it or not. Whether you understand it or not, you're in the palm of his hand. Whether you can conceive of it or not, he's already chosen you and predestined you. So we're going to be talking about the doctrine of the justification by faith and some other things that Tozer addresses that involve really the evangelical, a person who is a Christian who says that he has the Spirit of God, who knows God, who walks with God, who reads their Bible, who goes to church, who does the things that are religious, but do they hear God speak? Do they have that personal relationship, that dynamic of God in their life, or are they just pretending that they know God in some way? Now, I don't know about you, but I know my wife, up to a point. She's predictable up to a certain amount of predictability. She's a blonde, so she's totally unpredictable, so I get to leave it at that. But no, seriously, on a one-to-one -one basis, I know my wife. I live with her. I talk to her. I deal with her daily. Matter of fact, I even sleep with her. <gasps> you sleep with your wife? Oh, my God. Did you know that there was a time when that would not have been normal? Even in this society of America, men and women didn't always sleep with each other. They were wise enough to know that, you know what? That guy's snoring ought to be in the other room. And when you came together for a certain reason, you knew what the reason was. Now we just sleep together because it's the thing to do. But there was a time even on television, if you could believe it, where you couldn't show a man and a woman in the same bed. They had to separate the beds. And that's the way that most people lived at one point in time in America. Now, it's often interesting, you know, that we have these cultural attachments to our way of faith. We have these cultural attachments that we think about God with. Sometimes we use those and we confuse those as being what God has said, as opposed to what God is doing in our life. And so with evangelicals, Tozer had to address certain things that people were out of order with. Because they had taken it to such an extreme, they had chosen to reveal God in a way that he hasn't revealed himself. I don't want to do that. Here at Video Church, we want you to uncover the bedspread. Throw back the covers. Pull back the sheets. Let's see if you're sleeping with your wife or not. Or let's put it a different way and a way that you'll understand. Are you having intercourse with God or not? Now, you may say, well, are you talking about sexual intercourse? No, I'm not. You see, the word intercourse doesn't have to do with sex. But now we have chosen to make it the word for copulation. So in a lot of respects, in the olden days, when we used the word intercourse, it meant to have interpersonal relationship of some type a relationship of one person and another person crossing paths, intersecting with each other, interlocuting as it were, or interpersonal communication in some way. Your intercourse with your wife would often be sometimes just saying hi. Matter of fact, you're going to find that the intercourse that a lot of elderly people have has nothing to do with sex. And it doesn't have anything to do with being in bed or naked. It has to do with a relationship that they have of fellowship one with another, a communion of spirits that's deeper and more binding and more bonding than the actual physical manifestation of copulation. Now, I understand if you don't understand that, because that's where your mindset is, not in the gutter, but in copulating and not in intercourse. So we're going to talk about God and intercourse. Because, after all, that's got you titillated in some ways, excited in others, but hopefully prospering in the way that you should go. Because, quite frankly, 
God knows where your mind is at, as well as your heart. So let's read from Tozer today and uncover this idea of what he's trying to speak to us about in pursuing after God. The doctrine of justification by faith, a biblical truth, and a blessed relief from sterile legalism and unavailing self-effort has in our time fallen into evil company and been interpreted by many in such a manner as to actually bar men from the knowledge of God. They no longer know God or know of God. The whole transaction of religious conversion has been made mechanical and spiritless. Faith may now be exercised without a jar to the moral life and without embarrassment to the Adamic ego. One of the ways Tozer speaks is often in English that we don't use, or in grammar that we confuse, or sometimes in intellect that we don't use, but we abuse. Because we should be intelligent enough to understand what he's saying, but oftentimes we have to reduce it to cliché. In other words, what he's trying to say is that while you may have faith, if you don't have faith that changes you, if you don't have a relationship with God that is causing you some moral redress or causing you to change your way of life, you probably aren't saved. You've probably gotten confused with this idea of just, hey, it's been done for me, I just take it as a free gift, and then I have that cheap grace that others have warned about. Even Tozer himself wrote about cheap grace that costs you nothing. Because you see, faith without works is dead, and in reality, what they were talking about with faith without works isn't works of righteousness. It isn't works of faith. It's a work of love. It's a reality of a responsiveness to the things that God has said, and whether or not you're doing them shows whether you're having intercourse with God or you're just having, to put it bluntly, spiritual masturbation. Now, I'm using a lot of sexual words in order to stimulate your conversation because in reality, you aren't going to change your ways unless you are told something direct by God. And I want you to realize how serious this is rather than to be stimulated or inspired to go into the worldly way of looking at all of these things because that's what Christianity has done with a lot of the truths that God has said. Deny yourself was one of the first principles that God had said in his word. Jesus himself said, go, preach, teach, but tell them, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now, I don't know where deny yourself went. I don't know where take up your cross went, and I don't know where follow me went. But I can tell you this. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is risen from the dead is a nice statement of what God has done. That's religious doctrine. Saying that you should come forth and confess me before man and I'll confess you before my father is a nice statement of doctrine of what happens after salvation. Those things that we use in an altar call are awfully nice when it comes to the Billy Graham Evangelical Association of trying to make you understand the reality of the covenant agreement that you're making but where in the world did deny yourself take up your cross and follow me that jesus said bluntly go nowhere you see he still says it today he hasn't changed his way he's the same yesterday today and tomorrow so if you're following hard after god guess what it's not just getting it but it's doing it and that's what tozer's trying to say he's trying to say look Put up or shut up, but shut up first and just show me what you're doing and I'll be able to tell whether or not you're talking the walk or walking the talk. Because the reality is a lot of people think that if they go up 17 times in a concert and just take it and fake it, then sooner or later they're going to make it. And it doesn't work that way. Because they could die tomorrow and not be in heaven and it may be the most dynamic person you saw at church with a very charismatic personality. But there's only one thing that gets you into heaven, and that's a personal relationship with Jesus. You must be born again, not of your flesh, not of the spirit only, but of the spirit of God who worketh in you both to do it to will of his good pleasure, not yours. You see, there are a lot of people that say, hey, you know, I'll take God as long as I get to dictate the terms. Hey, I'll take God as long as I get to 
make up my own way of salvation. I'll take God as long as I get to have my own way. You know, you got to listen to some of the messages when you're giving an altar call. And you see, there's a lot of hype to build up to the moment of giving your life. But there's not a lot of much afterwards to say, this is what you're doing. Matter of fact, I would tell someone, don't come forward. Don't give 17 altar calls. Well, you know, I think we, you know, we'll give it one more time, a little longer. We've got to give you like five. Yeah, we wait a minute. Five more minutes. Okay, we're waiting till the last minute. So he's going he's gonna to say at least three more times, you know, the altar call. So let's just wait till the last minute and come running down. I got news for you. That ain't it. Matter of fact, statistically, we're being told that in most of these giant crusades, 60% aren't saved that most of them are going forward in multiple altar calls at multiple evangelical groups that year after year they go back and rededicate or recommit or commit over and over again just to make sure they got I got to make sure I'm saved now I don't know about you if I get pulled out of a pool of water and I was drowning I wouldn't go back into that pool of water I'd be yanked out set my feet upon dry ground and I would shake off the water and not go back in where I was drowning. That's what Tozer is talking about. There has to be that demonstration of a difference in your life or let me clarify something for you. You probably aren't doing what Jesus said. Giving him your life. Calling upon him to be saved. Talking to him about your salvation. Now, the church is going to give you a wonderful way of approaching God in 10,000 different ways. The basic premise of the church is simply this. God is teaching you. God is reaching you. God has done everything for you, and you don't need anything else after that. You don't need the church. Now, I will tell you this. You should go to church. I personally think that church is one of the most dynamic midwives there is to giving birth to the bride of Jesus. I think that the church is one of the most dynamic schooling methodologies that God has given for people to come together in order to learn of God, to know God, and to experience God. Those are wonderful things that we call church, but that's not church. That's really not. You see, church really is just simply a bunch of people getting together and talking about God. So it's not a building. It's not the for doctrine, reproof, instruction, and righteousness and all the other good things that Paul was talking about because he was influenced by Hellenism and by the church movement and the Gentiles had no way of knowing what a society should be like. They were growing up in the Roman culture. So they had to learn a new culture. So there is those churches that are designed in some ways for a school of theology, a Bible school, or a school to teach you about God. There are some churches that are taught and teaching about relationships that are masters at developing relationships you know your family and your friends and your your kids there are some churches that are dynamic in teaching like public education schooling in vocational skills in learning how to be applying yourself to life and growing up into the knowledge of doing a job and performing with your hands a certain skill set there are churches that are very good at some of these things but no one church does all these things and when they do it they do it poorly they do one thing good a lot of things poorly and that's why what really the church is meant to be is to show me and to reveal to me Jesus to teach me and help me and instruct me so that I can learn about God on my own as I am led by God to do with God what I should be doing according to what God has told me because that's really what church should be that's what we do here at Video Church, by the way, in case you're wondering, is that you can see that we're, we've got people lined up, you know, and seated everywhere, you know, and they're just packing them in, you know, just to get more thousands of people in so that we can, you know, they're all looking forward to that, that idea that they are personally accountable, personally responsible, personally learning, personally discovering, and personally being taught by God. So they're all coming to find that out because, after all, you can't get away with nothing once you finally get to that personal part because then God is intervening. Oh well, <laughs> maybe in the convenience of your own home you can get personal. That's why we do it this way. You see, the church is now expanding itself, as usual. They're always expanding, you know, it's kind of like hot air expands. Well, 
That's the church. It always expands. It hasn't learned that it's supposed to contract. But we won't talk about that. That's not for this lesson. It's for another time. But the church is always expanding. Now they're wanting to go into videography and, you know, getting you to be able to see a church and go to a building to sit inside and watch the pastor from somewhere else, even thousands of miles away, on a big giant screen so that you're with all your friends watching TV. Uh, can I ask you a question? So what's the difference between that and watching a football game? I mean, or a baseball game or playing Warcraft or I don't know all the popular games that are out there. Oh, Recon, that one, military game, you know, kind of sniper or something. I can't think it was there. Anyways, you know what I'm saying. You could be at home doing that. So really, when God started Vidivo, that's what he had in mind. Vidivo Church was about, let's take the big screen and put it into the personal screen so that you could deal with God one-on-one -on -one at home. If you happen to come to the public venue where we are now, we'll talk, we'll share, we'll relate, we'll care. But we're never going to be a mega church. Got news for you. Ain't going to happen, buddy. No. I'm sorry, but, you know, I talk to people. I relate to them. They relate to me. If you learn enough, I'm sending you out. I'm saying, hey, you know, you need to get out of here and go do something with what you've learned. Because you know God, and you already know God, and you know what God is telling you, and God's telling you to go somewhere. So go somewhere. Do something. Be something. Accomplish the purpose God intended. Now, there are those that are teaching something different, and that's why Tozer often has to be the one to address it. Because if I come off and tell everybody what I'm thinking, they say, well, who are you? Well... Right now, Tozer is somebody that everybody thinks, oh, wow, he's wonderful. And yet, at the time that he was living, he wasn't considered so wonderful because he called himself a prophet of God. Interesting, isn't it? That we now love Tozer, even though he called himself a prophet. The modern scientist has lost God amid the wonders of his world. We Christians are in real danger of losing God amid the wonders of his word. We have almost forgotten that God is a person and as such can be cultivated as any person can. We can have a more intimate and personal relationship, not just a casual friendship. It is inherent in personality to be able to know other personalities, but full knowledge of one personality by another cannot be achieved in one encounter. It is only after long and loving mental intercourse that the full possibilities of both can be explored. You know, the longer I get to know my wife, the longer I understand her and she becomes like me and I become like her. We have certain characteristics that rub off on each other. We have certain fundamental facts that we enjoy each other's company in and some things that we say we don't want each other's company in. I personally don't want to work with my wife side by side. Because either she'll understand that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in charge because, quite frankly, she likes to be in charge. And I like her in charge of doing the things that she does. But when she's working with me, I have a very quick, fast way of solving things. And she has a long process of doing things in a different way, cooperatively working with a group. I'm able to accomplish things in a short period of time very quickly because I can see the end and accomplish to the goal thereof by solving it in a new and unique way. So... Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. Sometimes the process is more important than the goal. And so together we complement each other. So in and of itself, there are times where in intercourse with God, I would like to get to the end, you know, and say, hey, God, take me home. I'm ready. I'm out of here. Let's go. And God says, no, I want you to learn the process. I want you to develop relationships. I want you to be involved with other people. I want you to cooperatively get to know me so that you understand when you get here, you're not disappointed. Well, frankly, I'm going to be in such awe, I know I won't be disappointed, but you might be. You might have this idea that somehow your Harley is going with you into heaven, or that your electric guitar or some other worldly manifestation of the looking through the glass darkly, you think that you're taking all of this junk with you. I got news for you. Anything man has made ain't going. What God has made, you might get an idea of. If you look at creation, you might get an idea of where God's coming from. If you look at man creation, which is man, manation, or mammon, manation is the word that I wanted. If you look at manation, what man has created, or mammon, what man has created, or how man uses creation, then you'll discover it's always abusive, not useless. God does not, man does not use what God has given us in a creative, positive way. 
We use it as a abusive way, and we usually defile it. Usually. I'm not going to say in every occurrence, because some things God said are holy. And when he does it, what can I say? All social intercourse between human beings is a response to personality to personality, grading upwards from the most casual brush between man and man to the fullest, most intimate communion on which the human soul is capable. Religion, so far as it is genuine, is in essence the response of created personalities to the creating personality who is God. God gave us personality. <coughs> God created in us personality. And this is what God says about personality. This is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We're going to stop there on that, because sometimes people think, you know, and I got to be honest with you, I might have thought that when I first got saved, not very long, because I suddenly discovered that some of the things that were told me were an error. But you might think that somehow eternal life is just this idea of perpetuity of existence. Now, perpetuity is simply a word that means perpetual. It means that it goes on and on and on and on and on. Now, in the old days, in Hebrew, the way of communicating the idea of perpetuity or eternal life or this perpetuity of existence is ages to ages. That was the word that was used in order to describe eternal life. It was an ages to ages life. And because it was in the now, as God is in the now, and it wasn't in the was, or is, or shall be, but rather is a continuity of those, then we discover that the ages to ages to ages to ages to ages in a never-ending, never, well, never-ending succession of ages means that there's something that, ex that exists or something that's happening in each one of these ages. Now, it doesn't say that it's escalation or descalation. We know at the end of the Bible, the end of when God has spoken to us, he says that he would create a new heaven and a new earth. We know there's a new age coming, a new age of whatever that age may be. I have no idea. I know that we'll be equipped for it. I know that we will not go through anything that was, but we will be in existing of what is. And so that will be, at that time, whatever that is, is with God. So in and of itself, when they say in the scriptures that God is speaking and that God tells us this is eternal life, you should know this is eternal life. Knowing God, that's what eternal life is. So what we're getting to learn from and we're becoming more involved in is knowing God. That's why we're calling this following hard after God, building upon each step. The first step was that, you know, the salvation issue. And then the second step was we're dealing with religion and dealing with all this idea of, you know, like we've got the wrong idea, really, what, the, what religion's going to boil down to, knowing us, or knowing God and knowing his son. So, in fact, we should follow up on whatever it is that God says about how to know him and how to uncover who he is, what he is, and what he's all about. Because it's not about religion. Those are nice things. And churches specialize in them. Paul gave Corinthians some warnings. Paul talked to Galatians about some things. All of those things are profitable in and of themselves as a small part of a foundation that you are learning to know God in a more personal, intimate way. You are getting to know Jesus in an intimate way that you should have relationship with him. You are becoming more aware that there should be intercourse between you and God by way of his spirit. As you begin to examine these things, you're going to find and discover that God's drawing you in by his own sovereign will, by his grace intervening in your life, by causing things to happen in your life to make you turn to God and to understand that he's the one causing it to happen to you. In other words, there's not bad things happening to good people. There's good things happening to everyone. And the good thing is that God is in control of everything and that there's not one thing that happens without his being involved in. For that is impossible for him to be God, except that God is involved in everything. And when I say everything, there isn't anything I mean that isn't everything. So let's be clear. To sum it all up, in this service we've discovered that this is what eternal life is. And this is what we should be seeking after. This is what we should be doing. Pursuing the knowledge of God and his son Jesus. 
This is eternal life, that they should know me and know him who sent me. Are you willing? Do you want to? Or are you going to walk away? Peter had a problem with that, and he couldn't deal with it. So he finally just said, look, I don't... I'm not going to leave you, but I don't understand you. I'm not going to go away from you, but I don't get it. I don't know what to do, but I do know this. You got the words of eternal life. You are, if he could have said it, one step farther, as Jesus said. You are eternal life. So the fact is, you have to make a decision. Do you want to pursue after God? Do you want to follow hard after God? Are you willing to go the extra mile? Are you willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me? Otherwise, in this service the rest of the day, you might as well go away. You might as well go do something else. You might as well watch football or baseball. I know it's baseball season. I think football's getting started today. I think. I'm not sure. But you might as well find something else to do because, let me be clear with you, God is involving himself in the affairs of man, and you will know there is a living God if you have had any doubt before. But God isn't playing around with the reality of the world coming to an end. The fact is, he wants you to not worry about the end of the world or to look for a rapture or to look for a second coming. He wants you to know him in a personal, intimate way, to have intercourse with him, to have communion with him, to have relationship with him, to have a love that chooses him over your wife or your husband or your child or your daughter or your kid. And that's not easy. It's not something that he says you can do by yourself. It's not something that he says you can do even with the Spirit of God. But he says it this way, and he's very clear about it. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me.